Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Randy Wyckoff, the Dean of the College of Public Health, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Leading Voices in Public Health Lecture Series event for February 2012. It's a real honor to have all of you here, and especially to introduce our uh, keynote speaker this evening. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Frank, though, I would like to welcome a special new guest, um, the ninth president of East Tennessee State University, Dr. Brian Nolan. We hope that this is the first of many Leading Voices events that you can, you can attend. Um, in the, since 2006, since we began this series, we've had 28 Leading Voices events. This is the 29th. And I think I can honestly say that we have never had a speaker whose accomplishments in the field of public health are as impressive as our speaker this evening. Uh, Dr. Julio Frank uh, has a, a long career. I can only highlight a few issues. He created the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, which is the premier school of public health, and became the first uh, CIF accredited school outside of the United States. Uh, he then became Minister of Health of Mexico, a position that he held for six years. Uh, starting a national health insurance plan. Imagine that. <laughs> he then worked for the World Health Organization and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and then in 2009 uh, became the dean of the School of Public Health at Harvard uh, because the ETSU position was taken at that time. <laughs> uh, but, but truly, uh, reflecting on the breadth of his career, it's really a remarkable accomplishment, and it's no surprise that when an international commission was put together to look at how we transform health professional education, not just for public health, not just for medicine, not just for nursing, but for all of the professions, and how do we do it not just domestically but internationally, the person they asked to co-chair that commission is our speaker this evening. So please join me in welcoming a true leading voice in public health, Dr. Julio Frank. Thank you, thank you, Randy, for your very kind words. Uh, it really is uh, my, my great honor to, to be here tonight. Uh, I'm very honored to have uh, President Noland uh, here today and Vice President Bishop. I really thank you very much for, for attending the lecture and having all of you here, uh, it's, it's, it's really um, a great opportunity for me to, to get, uh, not just to visit your campus but uh, understand more of the fantastic work that you are carrying out and with Randy we've been talking about uh, uh, future collaborations between our schools I think um, I'm, I'm very inspired by, by what I have seen today uh, and in fact I've seen a lot of things that uh, we proposed in that uh, report um, so so it's really exhilarating to, to see how, how you're moving forward uh, and what I want to do tonight is uh, exactly reflect with you about the future of the education of health professionals. Uh, I did have the honor of uh, co-chairing this commission, that's the name of the commission, Education of Health Professionals for the 21st Century. Uh, it was you know, about a year and a half of, of um, intensive work. Uh, and we came up with a number of ideas that <coughs> I'd like to share with you. There are a few copies of the report, both at the back and at the front. Uh, if uh, you know any, if they run, uh, we run out of copies. I'll, I'll be glad to send uh, a, a copy to, to to anyone who 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 wishes. But I'm not going to repeat what's in the report. Actually, you're going to get everything that never made it into print. So that's uh, this is a real story. So the report was published in the Lancet. It's uh, one of the so-called Lancet reports. The Lancet, which, as you know, is um, one of the very one of the leading uh, journals. Um, started this figure of publishing full reports of commissions on a number of, of issues. They've done one on climate change and health and a number of, of uh, big topics like that. And we were lucky that this was a Lancet report, so the, it actually got published in the main body of the journal, uh, and that has given it a lot of uh, wide dissemination. Because it's a 30,000-word report and it's hard to read in Lancet print, we actually did a book version, which is the one we have here, 
but it's exactly the same, uh, the same uh, text. Um, and the reason or the initial motivation for uh, producing this report was the fact that we were approaching the centennial of uh, the landmark Flexner report of 1910. Our report appeared in 2010. We barely made it. It was launched on November the 30th and December the 1st of 2010. Randy actually attended the launch in Boston. Um, and we wanted to, 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 to get it out exactly to mark the centennial. Something happened, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about that, uh, but something happened in the turn of the 19th to the 20th century that the education of health professionals became a topic of enormous interest. So in a concentrated period of time, we had a number of, of, of reports. Of course, the Flexner Report on Medical Education, although the title originally said in the United States and Canada, it went on to influence the shape of medical education all over the world. Then five years later, in 1915, the Walsh Rose Report, which did the same thing for public health education. And then in 1922, uh, the uh, Goldmark Report on uh, nursing education. And then a few years later, uh, there was a, a similar report for dental education. So there was this uh, flurry of interest uh, on, on the education of health professionals. So <clears throat> to mark the centennial, we assembled this commission. There were 20 commissioners. Uh, I uh, had the honor of co-chairing it. The, my co-chair was uh, Dr. Lincoln Chen, president of the China Medical Board, itself a foundation that was founded in 1914 to promote the Flexnerian Mall in China. And it created the Peking Union Medical College, the first example of flexnerial, medical, flexnerial model of medical education in, uh, outside of the United States and Canada. Uh, we also got funding from the Gates Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. We had, uh, in addition to the 20 commissioners, a number of advisors, and most interestingly, we had a, a group of youth, uh, young commissioners, both students and recent graduates, which pro provide a lot of very interesting input. We commissioned papers, did consultations, did a little bit of research, and we ended up with this um, uh, report which did have, as uh, Randy was mentioning, a global uh, outlook. Its recommendations are not uh, exclusive to any country or group of countries. We believe that some of the analysis applies both to rich and poor countries alike uh, because uh, we do live in a very interconnected world. It is multi-professional, and um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. The title of the report, um, I, I've learned that in a good report, you need to summarize the message in the title. Uh, so the title is Health Professionals for a New Century. The idea is, you know, 100 years have gone by, we're facing a new century. But the subtitle, I think, contains the three key words that are uh, essential, and they are in this yellowish color. Um, th these are not meant exactly to replicate your own colors of your <laughs> sport teams, but they come close enough. Uh, so transforming, that's the first key word, it's about transformation. Education to strengthen health systems, a systems approach is the second key word, in an interdependent world. The idea that we are really, uh, and education highlights the level of interdependence. So what's new of this commission, it, it really had a global outlook. It focuses on all health professions, not just one. There were several reports published during 2010, but they were mostly referring either to one country or to one profession, typically medicine. It did focus on, uh, whoops, on, on post-secondary education. There had been a lot of reports on the education of community health workers, which is a very important topic, and I'll come back to that. But we thought it was also important to talk about the, um, uh, the, the leadership, the top of the pyramid uh, in, 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 in many countries. We, I think, propose a, an integrative framework and then uh, a number of specific recommendations. What I'd like to do today is really just give you a very brief uh, summary, and actually I will talk about some things that are not in the report. Um, basically to look at what, uh, what motivated, what happened in this 100 years uh, since the Flexner report. Then share with you the framework, give you really just a couple of, of the main findings of the report, and then focus more on the uh, um, recommendations, and then tell you a little bit, uh, bring you up to date with what has happened, because a year has gone by since the report was launched, 
and a lot has happened, including in, in, in my own school at the Harvard School of Public Health, which I think op opens up very interesting possibilities for collaboration. So let me start with just a little bit of, of um, why, why we did this. Uh, the 100 years that have passed since the Flexner Report are not just any 100 years. These are the 100 years with the most deep, intense change in health affairs in the history of humankind. These are the 100 years that totally change the face of health affairs uh, in, in the whole world. Just uh, to, we, we don't have time to go into all the dimensions of that change. But just to use our summary indicator for, for summarizing the health of population, which is life expectancy at birth. You know, for most of human history, it was fairly constant at relatively low levels. Of course, this is a simplification because for most of human history, this was characterized by peaks of mortality. So you had, you know, a, a more or less low level around 24 years of life expectancy. And then, you know, you got the Black Death killing a third of the population of Europe. And you got the uh, Europeans' um, uh, contact with the Americas and, you know, brought smallpox and killed 90% of the population in what's today Mexico and, and so forth. So you had all these peaks. Of course, cholera in London as early as the 19th century with, uh, with Dr. Snow um, figuring out that cholera actually was transmitted by water uh, and, and not by, by the air. Until very recently, this was the story, a low level with epidemic peaks that killed just massively. And then, and, and that's how we arrived to the beginning of the 20th century with a life expectancy for the world of around 30 years. And then something happened. And by 1984, that life expectancy had more than doubled to 65 years of age. So it means then, you know, in, 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 in eight decades, humankind as a whole experienced a larger gain in life expectancy than in all its previously accumulated history. And so, you know, the question has been why? I mean, what drove this spectacular increase in life expectancy, which reflects a, a very sharp decline in mortality? And there's been basically two, exp well, or one leading explanation has been, well, this was just about, you know, general improvement in living conditions. This coincided with the Industrial Revolution, uh, and, you know, just countries got richer, and if you're wealthier, you can you know, have better food, have better housing, have better schooling for kids. So this was just a reflection of the general improvement in living conditions that, that we saw starting in the 20th century. And that is actually true. This graph comes from <coughs> the classical work by Sam Preston that shows that indeed, if you chart income per capita summary measure of the wealth or the level of development of a country, against our summary measure of health life expectancy. Each of these dots is a country. And you do see that indeed, th as countries get richer, their life expectancy improves. But what's remarkable about this finding is the fact that for every decade of the 20th century, this relationship shifted upwards. Meaning that in each decade, for the same level of income per capita, we got more health. And uh, so, you know, here at $5,000, here's where we're at in, 19, in 1900. By 1930, we were up here, we were up here, we were up here. And obviously, this shift upwards cannot be explained by increases in wealth. What accounts for that shift upwards? That shift upwards is the role of knowledge in improving health. Another way of looking at it is just to compare the United States with the country of Chile. It turns out, just by chance, <coughs> that Chile in 1990 had exactly the same income per capita that the U in constant dollars. This is all constant dollars, right? In 1990, it had exactly the same income per capita that the United States had in 1900. But with the same income per capita, Chilean women in 1990 had a life expectancy of 79 years, whereas American women had a life expectancy of 49 years for the same income per capita. And this jump of 30 years of life expectancy at birth for the same income, that's the effect of knowledge. Now, how does knowledge improve health? 
Well, there's three basic mechanisms. The first one, the better known one, is that knowledge gets translated into technologies, right? Better vaccines, better drugs, better diagnostic methods, and then that improves health. And that's the way we tend to think of what happened in the 20th century. We got, you know, until about the middle of the 20th century, you know, the armamentarium of it, your average uh, uh, physician or nurse was very limited indeed, and you had more chances of being harmed than than getting well if you, if you dare to visit a, 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 a doctor. Uh, so, yeah, technology is a big part of that explanation. But in addition, knowledge gets internalized by people who then use it to shape their behavior in key domains of everyday life. You know, the way we bring our children up, the food we eat, our sexual behavior, all of that gets shaped by knowledge. People wash their hands, personal hygiene, because of you know, evidence about the role of microbes in transmitting disease. People stop smoking because of the evidence that tobacco kills. So knowledge not only gets translated into technologies, it's also internalized and helps us shape our understanding of the world and empowers us with good evidence to shape our own lives. And then finally, knowledge translated into evidence guides policy making which hopefully is based on scientifically derived uh, 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 evidence. So that's the way knowledge improves health, through those three mechanisms, through technology, through empowering people to shape their own lives, and through informing health policy. The reason I'm saying all of this is you know, because the whole rationale for this commission and this report, the reason this is an important topic it's not because this was a group of health professionals self-declaring that we are the most important people on earth and we've got to be really very focused on how we educate the next generations of ourselves. It's because health professionals are actually the vehicles, the vectors through which knowledge becomes translated into health improvement. And frankly, I think that you know, going from 30 years of life expectancy to upwards of 70, where you know, most countries in the world are today, is a pretty important thing for humankind. And it's been health professionals that account for that fraction, about two thirds of the health improvement in, during the 20th century is due to advances in knowledge. And it's health professionals that you know, literally embody that knowledge through their education. And then they're the ones who you know, drive the discoveries that lead to better technologies. They're the ones who interact with the population and educate the public and transmit the necessary elements. And very often, it's health professionals who occupy the policy positions and who are making decisions about programs and policies that are based on knowledge. So uh, that's the motivation. This was not just any century. It was a century of greater advance in health, in human history. And the driver for that was knowledge. And professionals happen to be the vectors through which knowledge improves health. The other thing that happened in this 100 years is that uh, we, you know, until the, until the 20th century, caring for health was delegated to relatively undifferentiated social institutions, like the family or religious institutions. I mean, really, the hospital was not a place where you went to get cured until the 20th century. The, the, the hospital was mostly a place of shelter, typically for very poor destitute people where they went to die. A hospital was a place you went to die, not where you went to get cured. There's still a lot of people die in hospitals, but by and large, the meaning of the hospital has changed. We barely had health professionals. We didn't have anything we could really call a health system. And one of the most profound social transformations of the health system is how we develop all of these specialized institutions whose only job in life is to actually take care of health. And this has now become the largest sector of the largest economy in the world, namely the US economy, with 70% of, the, of, of GDP, the largest sector. It's larger than all military and educational expenditures put together. It is 10% of the world economy, about $6 trillion. And even in the poorest countries, the health sector is now a large part of social life. Um, how many of you were born at home. Any, anyone in this room was born at home, was not born in a healthcare facility? 
one person. I bet you if we were having this lecture you know, 100 years ago, everyone would have raised your hands. Most human beings, the vast majority of the 7 billion people, even the poorest, now come in contact with the set of institutions and differentiated professional roles that we call the health system. Most of us are now born in, a, in contact with the health system, will die in the health system, and spend substantial amount of time. And all of us in this room actually make a living out of the fact that we have this differentiated set of institutions we call the health system. The largest employer in Europe is not a Franco-German chemical consortium. It's a public corporation called the National Health Service of Great Britain, which is actually the third largest employer in the world, only superseded by the Red Army in China and Indian Rails. That's it. I mean, the third largest is the, 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 the British National Health Service. So the other thing that happened in the 20th century is we developed this set of differentiated institutions called the health system, which is now a daily presence in our lives. And that health system, everywhere in the world, is being subject to unprecedented pressures. First of all, a, a, a phenomenally fast demographic transition with aging of people and an epidemiologic transition. The whole profile, this decline in mortality that drove the increase in life expectancy didn't occur uh, randomly. It basically meant a fundamental shift from acute infectious diseases as the main cause of death to chronic diseases, where now you know, as the experience of illness has stopped being just a succession of acute episodes from, one, from which one either recovers or dies to become a condition of living. People live with AIDS, people live with cancer, a condition that's very often stigmatized. So the whole meaning of, of disease has changed, mostly towards chronic conditions and with an aging population. This has happened in an era of very fast technological innovation with huge population demands, a realization that healthcare is really a right. So that right is being demanded for access to these technological innovations and of course a huge level of professional differentiation. The fact that today we have you know, literally many, many categories of health professions. So <clears throat> that's why we thought it was important to actually say, well, you know, after 100 years of the landmark report, what, how, how do we think about the education of this very important set of actors called the health professionals in the 21st century? And to answer that question, we developed an integrative framework. I'm just going to show two slides. That's a very important part of the report, and anyone who, uh, who's interested, you can read about that. But let me just show two slides. The first one shows the, one of the three keywords, the way we adopted a systems approach. And the idea here is try to understand <coughs> the connection, the relationship between the health system and the education system. At, you know, part of those two systems, at, at the core of those two systems is a population. The population is not external to the health system. The population is central, nor is it external to the education system. Because remember, when it comes to health and education, people are not just consumers or our clients. They're actually co-producers, both of health and of education. So they are part of, we are all part of the health system. So <clears throat> this population, they have both health needs and educational needs that get translated into demands. And then the institutional side of the educational system provides an educational service that then determines the supply of the health workforce. How many doctors, nurses, uh, dentists, pharmacists, um, uh, physical rehabilitation uh, experts. That's the supply of the health workforce. And on the other side, the health system, through the provision of health services, generates a demand for the health work workforce. And those two systems interact in the labor market for health professionals where there's a supply and a demand, not just on quantitative but also on qualitative terms. Of course, academic health centers are very interesting uh, <coughs> entities because they are part of both systems, right? They are usually part of the health system. They provide care and they are very much part of the education system. So academic health centers are actually straddling these two health systems, uh, these two uh, systems. But the main idea in this framework was to try to take the systemic approach, which you will see in a moment, it's very important for the kind of recommendations that the commission issued. Now, if we zoom in to the education system, we <coughs> try to propose a, a comprehensive view 
Uh, looking uh, at the structure, the institutions where, where uh, education happens, the process, the instructional design, and then the outcomes. And this is important because a lot of the reports that appeared in, during 2010 and some previous one have tended to focus on the instructional side of education. The curriculum, what's the curriculum like, um, you know, what we call here the four C's, the criteria for admission, the competencies, the channels, which are the, the, the methods and techniques for, for instruction, and those typically define the curriculum, and then the career pathways. But if you go back to Flexner, actually Flexner certainly had a lot to say about instructional design, but what was very original is that the Flexner report also dealt with the question of institutional design. It not just answered the question, what should be taught, and how should we teach it, that's the instructional side, but it also said, where should we teach it? And Flexner you know, came out with very important recommendations. Medical schools should be part of universities. Very mind, in 1910, most medical schools were proprietary, proprietary freestanding institutions completely disconnected from universities. So Flexner said, no, they should be part of universities. They should be organized by departments. They should have a, a relationship with a hospital, et cetera. They made a number of statements about the institutional design. So this report followed in that tradition and said, yeah, we should also look at the institutions where this instruction gets carried out, the structures. The difference now is that most of the Flexner uh, report talked about the organizational level, but there's also a systemic level. We need to look at the entire education system of which any one organization, like let's say uh, uh, your university, is, is one, but it's part of a larger system. And then in the 21st century, we need to think about institutional design at the global level. And I'll talk a little bit more about the possibility, especially, of creating networks and partnerships across the world. So this was uh, the, 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 the main framework, uh, trying to look at the institutions, then the instructional design with this life cycle all the way from the criteria for admission to the career pathways. And then we propose two outcomes, which we call interdependence in education. That's the outcome that derives from the institutional design and transformative learning from the instructional design. I'll, I'll explain what these two words mean in a minute. But let me first, before getting too far into the definitions, just give you, a, a, again, just a very brief summary of some of the major findings. First of all, we did find some systemic failures. Again, this is not about any one country. Some of these things apply to, one, to some countries and not to others. This is you know, a, a, a really a, 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 the general picture for the world as a whole. But we found a number of uh, systemic failures, like a mismatch of competencies to needs, to population needs, very weak teamwork, uh, very, you know, we, we don't prepare people for, for teamwork, still major examples of gender stratification, um, uh, you know, not just the classical nursing medicine divide, but within professions, a number of, uh, of uh, stratifications about uh, along gender, and obviously some countries have come a long way, but in others, uh, you know, you basically have a, a huge gender imbalance when it comes to positions of responsibility. Um, still a lot of uh, predominance of hospital settings for um, education over primary care settings, major labor market imbalances uh, around the world, I mean literally countries where you find communities without doctors in the countryside and doctors without jobs in the cities. Uh, you know, really absurd situations like that are still quite prevalent. And then weak leadership that looks at the entire health system. Those were like, you know, at a very aggregate qualitative level, some of the findings. But we also did some quantitative analysis. Um, and I'll, I'll just give you a, a little bit of a flavor on, on a global scale. Not surprisingly, there's huge disparities globally on the availability of medical schools. This is an indicator of the density of medical schools uh, around the world, the number of schools per 10 million. And obviously there's huge variations with very large parts of the world where there are very, very few medical schools. Same thing schools of public health, very, very major disparities around the world in the availability of these resources. Actually, this is my favorite finding, and in fact, this graph here on this side actually was the cover of the Lancet 
that week when the report was published. And it shows a huge mismatch between the distribution of the burden of disease globally and the distribution of uh, health professionals. These are resized maps, and it shows, as you might expect, that when you quantify the burden of disease, Africa is, of course, hyper, a hypertrophic Africa here with most of the burden of disease concentrated here. And yet, this is where very, very few of the doctors, nurses, and other health professionals are located. There's actually, a, you know, even in the 21st century, huge amount of countries where there's zero medical schools, you know, 31 countries with zero medical schools, and then 44 where there's one medical school. And then in contrast, you have a few countries with a lot of medical schools. In fact, four countries in the world concentrate around 70% of the medical schools, and those are uh, China, you might expect that, India, uh, Brazil, and the U.S. Those four countries concentrate uh, you know, about 70% of medical schools in the, in the world. So great disparity in resources. I don't expect you to read this just to show you that we actually did a very a painstaking job because there's no really centralized sources of data on you know, the number of schools, the number of graduates, the workforce, um, doctors, nurses, midwives, and by regions of the world. But let me just uh, highlight one finding that I, I really didn't expect. Uh, we teamed up with the World Bank to do what I think is the first analysis of financing for health professional education in the world. And I was frankly shocked when we, we discovered, because uh, this had not been published, that the entire expenditure for all of health professional education in the world is less than 2% of total health expenditures in the world. I said a while ago that uh, for the world as a whole, the health industry is about 10% of the world economy. Around this is now updated to about $6 trillion. Only 100 billion is spent in the education of every health professional in every country in the world. And although 100 billion might sound like a lot of money, it's less than 2%. You know, I've spent about 25 years studying health systems. That's my area within public health. And suddenly it hit me why country after country we find these functional health systems. There's no other industry in the world that spends so little as a proportion of its to total financial turnover in the education of the leaders that are going to actually drive and determine, in the case of health, how the other 98% is spent. We only spend 2%. In the US, because health is so big, it's even worse as a proportion. You know, we spend almost 14 billion, uh, and it, it, here it's 0.5% that's spent in health professional education. And uh, I was greatly gratified since you know, I'm married to an economist, so I have nothing against economists, but uh, I've learned to check twice. So we actually demanded two approaches to these estimates, and we, I was very relieved to find that they basically converged in the bulk park figure of about 2% being spent on health professional education. Obviously, as you can imagine, huge disparities. I mean, in Africa, very little being spent, and obviously in Europe and North America, much, much higher amounts. But this is one uh, problem that I think the analysis discovered. Uh, in the U.S., if you compare, you know, it really is, this is just medical and nursing education, 15.6 uh, billion, which, you know, compares poorly with other very good things, like the NIH budget is about twice, and then some things that are not so good, like, um, you know, over-the-counter drugs uh, and all kinds of other uh, practices, some of which are valuable, not all of them are. are, are. So really, this is very, very small compared to other areas of expenditure in the United States. The final finding I wanted to share with you is we actually did a systematic literature review because a lot has been published in 100 years about the education of health professionals. And, um, uh, and I was you know, a little bit disappointed to find that in public health, we have published very little about our own the, the, the education. Most of the papers um, are about medical education, nursing ed with about three quarters, nursing education with about one quarter, and, and public health education. We really haven't spent a lot doing research about educational innovation and then publishing about that. 
So what do we do with this? Um, what are the main recommendations of the report? And again, I'll, I'll be very, uh, I'll just give you a, a, a general uh, uh, summary of that. Uh, first of all, we're very, very keenly aware that, as we just saw, this has been a topic of great discussion. You know, there's been a lot of very valuable innovation. So we actually talk of about three generations of reform. The first generation happened around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. And basically, on the instructional design side, the, the basic innovation was that it brought science into the curriculum. On the institutional side, I already said, it made health professional education part of the university. Uh, so we call this the science-based generation of reforms. Then around the, the 1970s, uh, we had a second generation where we moved to problem-based learning and we started thinking not just about universities, but academic centers. And I think we're now at the threshold of a third generation of reforms, which I would call systems-based. And where, as you will see, there's a lot of talk about making this competency-driven and actually looking at, the, at this systemic view. And I use the term generation, you know, that analogy. These are not waves or uh, to, to signify that just like with human generations where you know at a given point in time you have the grandchildren, the parents and the, the grandparents, so generations coexist. So there's still very valuable elements of all of the two preceding generations of reforms. I mean obviously we still want to have a scientific curriculum and we still problem-based learning is still a very, very important part of what we should be doing. So we build on that a third generation of reforms. This is just to say, you know, a lot has been done and we, we've made a lot of progress. So against that background, let me tell you what are the specific recommendations. This is the vision um, about, you know, we're, we're, this is important because we believe that this can drive equity in health, both for individual care, patient-centered, and a, for a population-based health. We come up with 10 recommendations, six on the instructional design and four for the institutional design. We don't have time to go through all of those. Uh, and then a number of enabling actions. Let me just, uh, obviously here, very important, enhancing investments. Uh, by the way, a, a strong emphasis on accreditation. We live in this global world. Um, and you know, health professional education is no longer a domestic issue. In the United States, a quarter of all physicians practicing in the United States were educated outside of the United States. So, you know, we might carry forward all the reforms we want in American schools of medicine, just to talk about medicine. In nursing, it's also a huge share of, 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 of that. If we don't look at this globally, given the high levels of migration of health professionals, then we're missing the picture. And a big issue is how do we actually align accreditation, make it responsive to local realities, but generate some form of standards so that, you know, this mobile uh, um, set of professions can actually perform competently wherever they are around the world. There's also the reverse migration with the emergence of global health as a field of great interest, especially for young, for students in the health professions. We also need to make sure that when you know, we go elsewhere, we also bring the necessary competencies. And of course, we pro propose an enhancement of investments. Uh, on the institutional side, an emphasis on joint planning, better uh, coordination, I mean, you, you um, find countries where, I, as I was saying, there's a total disconnect between the requirements of the health system and what universities are producing. And that doesn't mean a subservient role for universities. Part of the role of universities is to be innovative and think out of the box. But there has to be some level of coordination so that we align uh, uh, the requirements of the health system uh, and the needs of the population and what the educational system does. Uh, we are, you know, talk a lot about global networks as well. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, we think that the 194 countries that are members of the UN, each of them is going by itself, going to be able to produce its full complement of all health professionals. That, that's not going to happen. So, you know, we live in a world where the tools that have brought interconnection and interdependence can be mobilized also to build consortia and networks. Uh, and that also applies domestically, where you have huge regional variations in the U.S. and many other countries. 
where building consortia of educational institutions is one of the recommendations. But let me focus, so we, we don't have time, but maybe in the Q&A we can talk more about some of these ideas. But let me focus on just uh, a few of the instructional recommendations because I think they're particularly, um, let me start with the idea of competency driven. This is of course not a new idea. We've been talking about competency driven education for quite a while. But this is very important. I mean, we reaffirm the need for competency driven. I mean, what happens is that in most universities, the traditional model starts with the curriculum. Our point of departure is a curriculum which typically reflects the interest of the faculty and the way they themselves were taught. You know, universities are a very powerful mechanism for reproducing um, social customs. And that's our starting point, and we derive some educational objectives, and this is what we assess. Were those objectives met? Competency-based education turns this model on its head. And the starting point is not the curriculum, that's actually the last point. Starting point is an assessment of the health needs of populations and individuals and the requirements of the health system. And based on what the needs of people are and the, what the health system requires to satisfy the needs, then we define specific competencies, not as intermediate educational objectives, but actually as the outcomes of the educational process. And this is what we assess. And then this then drives the design of the curriculum. So it's a very, you know, more than a buzzword, uh, because I've, I've seen many competencies that really are the, the good old educational objectives just with a new label. Competency-based education really turns this on its head and makes the curriculum the last stage in the design rather than the beginning. And the report goes into quite a bit of detail and we commissioned some background papers on this and you can read all of that. The second recommendation that I wanted to focus is one where you have made a lot of progress and it's the idea of interprofessional education. Uh, <clears throat> uh, again, not, not a new idea. Most of the reports that have been published recently have emphasized interprofessional education. And you know, the need for interprofessional education is to me quite clear comes again from starting by assessing the needs of the health system. Because healthcare and public health have become so complex, teamwork is a need. It's a, a reality of the way we now work in the actual settings in the health system. And yet, the traditional dominant model, you know, students come in with a common pre-secondary high school education, and then they're rapidly channeled into their silos. And somehow, we expect that by some miracle, when they go out to work in the real world, they'll be able to work as a team. But why would they? I mean, everything we've taught them is that you are in medical school, you're in nursing school, you're in rehab, you're in public health, etc., and you don't talk to each other. Why would we expect them to then perform adequately as a team? So interprofessional education <coughs> uh, actually designs a set of core competencies that all professionals have to share. By the way, I'm, I'm only listing these three because for budgetary reasons we could only do the quantitative analysis for the three, but I, I think this applies to every health profession. I mean, we could list uh, pharmacy and, and rehab and, and ev every other one. I know you have five schools here. So we start with core uh, competencies. And, and one of which is to actually develop the competencies for working as a team. It's not trivial, it's not just holding hands and saying we're going to work as a team. There's a whole set of, there's an, a shared ethical framework, there are issues of communication, uh, of you know, how, how to actually integrate, how to divide work while keeping a common sense of mission. And you know, today I, I met with the uh, committee on interprofessional that Vice President Bishop has put together, and I was very impressed. I actually think that you are way ahead of where I have seen most of the conversation in other schools that I have talked about. So please persevere on that because this could be very important. Everyone is very interested in this question of interprofessional education. Our contribution in the report was, first of all, to endorse this idea. Um, uh, we do make the point that we made most progress in interprofessional education for those health professionals that are involved in direct patient care, and that we need to build into that teamwork idea, the public health component, both you know, the public health specialists that work on community health, 
including you know, uh, outbreak control and uh, measurement of health, but also the healthcare managers that are such a central part in an increasingly organized frame, they should be part of the team, not just those who are directly involved in patient care, but also everyone that plays an enabling role and those that also look after the health of entire populations. So we have a, a, a something to work there in interprofessional. And then we add the notion of transprofessional education to bring also the non-professional part of the health workforce, the community health workers, which in many parts of the world are the vast majority of the health workforce. And I think we need to also create educational opportunities where, for example, one of the specific competencies are cultural competencies to actually, because very often there's a cultural divide separating the professionals who've gone through university from the community health workers or those who come out of a, of a, secondary, uh, a secondary or a technical uh, education. So uh, the idea of transprofessional education is something we add to this. But I, I, I think you are on the right track and what I saw today I, I found very, very impressive. And then finally, um, uh, among the recommendations, let me just focus on you know, the other key word of transformative learning. What does that mean? When we are, try to articulate the vision, we say, well, all of this transformation of the, of the instructional design should lead to, to this idea of transformative learning. And the idea here is to recognize that there are three levels of learning, which you know, we call informative learning, formative learning, and transformative learning. Informative learning, as the name implies, is about transmitting information and concrete skills. And what you produce here are experts. That's very important. We have to be very competent experts. But it's not enough. We need to go to the next level, which is formative learning, where we introduce socialization into a set of values. And that's what transforms an expert into a professional. Professional is an expert who abides by the code of conduct that's underpinned by a, by, a, by a very explicit ethical framework. But that's still not enough in our day and age. We need to take the next uh, things to the next level through transformative learning. And what the objective here is to develop leadership attributes so that we produce change agents. Doesn't mean you know, that every health professional is gonna be an activist uh, advocating for whatever cause. It means that we all should be now uh, develop the leadership skills so that we can contribute to transforming the, our own conditions of practice. And we're not just being very good professionals, uh, but a critical of the way we work, but actually that we have the capacity to understand and lead change in our own organizations or at whatever level, in our own communities, at whatever level we are operating. Let me uh, end with telling you what's happened uh, in one slide and then tell you a little bit of what we're doing at Harvard. Um, the report generated a huge amount of interest so that after that launch in Boston that uh, Randy attended, there's been 20 worldwide uh, launches all over the world. There's six translations there now. We have done nothing. The commission disbanded after <laughs> this part of its report. It's have all been local groups and the Lancet made the, the, the text available for no charge. So there's now, it's been translated into Chinese and the Chinese have created a commission like this for their own, so that's gonna have a huge implication into Vietnamese, into French, Spanish, Arabic, and German, uh, uh, so a, a, a huge global impact. There's been several initiatives nationally. In the UN, U USA, uh, the Institute of Medicine has created a forum, so that's gonna follow up on a lot of the ideas. Uh, the inter uh, Academy Medical Panel is also uh, doing this, and then there's a consortium of universities on global health, and then I'll tell you a little bit what we're doing in, in, in this one university. But there's been national initiatives in these countries and then regional networks. This is uh, networks in Africa, which is a very exciting development around PEPFAR. It's being funded by the US government. It's called the Medical Education Partnership in Initiative and the Nursing Education Partnership Initiative, partnering with African uh, schools. And then there's an Asian network already. So a lot of um, uh, follow up around the world. Uh, <clears throat> I thought that, you know, having co-chaired this, which I started doing before I became dean, once I became dean, I thought I, I better practice what I preach or I would lose all credibility. So we've been working on looking at what are the implications of the report at Harvard, and Ian Lapp, who's here with me today, uh, I recruited him 
uh, from Colombia to actually lead our own process. Harvard will be turn 100 years. Our, the, our School of Public Health is celebrating its centennial next year. We were founded in 1913. So we've created this process called Roadmap to 2013. Um, and the main idea is to transform our own educational strategy. And um, we have deep roots. Uh, Milton Rosenau, who wrote one of the most influential textbooks, all of those of you, which is 99% of you, uh, are too young to uh, remember this, but Rosenau actually was one of the towering figures. And he published in 1915 a paper in JAMA, already having the idea that a school of, for health officers or public health should be a separate faculty, the basic idea that has then inspired a lot of what we, we have done. And then my predecessor, uh, Harvey Feimer, who's now the president of the Institute of Medicine, also in 94, uh, published a very important paper in the public health reviews. Uh, and he said something that I think continues to be true. You know, we, we still have to fulfill certain expectations that are set fundamental to our mission. So inspired by this legacy, we've embarked in a very ambitious project. Basically, um, but being quite specific, organizing triads, because Ian says that groups of three have been shown to work the best. So we have these triads of faculty members uh, around six topics. Um, the two of them on professional practice. We're trying to rethink our master's degree. And then we're moving to designing a new doctor of public health. Um, then you know, those who want to pursue research careers. What should a research doctorate be? You know, I'm, 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 I'm impressed. And then there's uh, something very specific to Harvard which is an issue around the PhD, which is probably not relevant. Uh, but the idea of the research doctorate, at a time when most advances in science are happening at the intersection of traditional disciplines, and when, you know, to quote my colleague, the dean of the School of Engineering, we need to be educating what she calls T-shaped individuals. Um, people who have the depth of knowledge, this is the vertical side, but who have the capacity to talk across disciplines. And most doctoral programs don't do that. We do I-shaped individuals, <laughs> very deep in one topic. But, but today, you know, most research, not just in the biological sciences, in the social sciences, is happening at the intersection. How do we get that mix right? And then um, the idea of uh, flexible learning, both through continuing and executive education, but then you know, we're, our, our students are having more and more plastic careers. They move from one setting to another, from one place to another. How, how do we create really lifelong learning opportunities? Uh, and how do we think of the university in the 21st century, not in you know, the usual tu tubular form, like a tube that has an entrance you know, that's called admission, and then you come out the other side as a graduate. It becomes a lifelong uh, with multiple entries uh, during your entire life. But that requires flexibility. And how do we think of the university in this era where knowledge is you know, ubiquitous? How, how do you do that? And then a number of issues for uh, the more traditional approaches in addition to this, uh, coming from, from insights about how do people learn? Uh, and the, the whole idea of experiential learning, I I immersive field experience, uh, and uh, you know, which is where we were talking with Randy earlier about the enormous opportunities to think of you know, consortia of schools, because we operate, you know, we're an urban uh, school in, with a lot of urban poverty. You are a semi-urban, but mostly located um, in Appalachia. I, 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 I've been taught that it's pronounced differently here than out, <laughs> out there. So um, you know, I think lots, in, when it comes to, the, to our understanding now, that um, it's, it's experience through practice that uh, should drive a lot of, of, of the learning. Um, and then obviously mobilizing the fantastic tools that globalization has put at our hands to build them into, you know, particularly the telecommunications revolution, not to replace the classroom experience, but actually to enrich it through mechanisms like telepresence and you know, really global um, classrooms. Um, and then you know, we've ask some interesting questions. You know, if we had to start from zero, how would we design a school? It's a good thought exercise. It would be very different from what we have. It's not that we're going to blow up what we have, but, but it's a good thought experiment. What is the evidence we need? Uh, we should enrich that literature, which is so poor, 
And I was encouraging the interprofessional committee that I met with today to please document the very innovative ideas you're going to put in place through the pilot study and, and, and disseminate them because we really need to learn from, from what you're doing. What partnerships, like the one we're, we're, we're talking uh, about, what's the role of e-learning, um, the idea of modularity, you know, how do we, to, to building flexible uh, uh, approaches, and you know, how, how do we measure success, uh, and what is quality when it comes to higher education. So let me close, you know, coming back to where I started. Um, you know, I said at the beginning, knowledge has been the big driver of health improvement. There's a circle of knowledge that involves its production through new research, produces new knowledge. It's reproduction. That's what we do with, edu with education. Because good education doesn't just transmit knowledge. It recreates it in the minds of the next generation. We then need to translate knowledge. To me, this is a core part of the university. It's not a peripheral. It's not an extension. Translating knowledge so that it can be used by people and by practitioners and by policymakers, the three Ps, is a central part of the university. And then when that knowledge is translated, it leads to action. It gets implemented. And then we close the circle because we study the effects of human action. What happened when we actually carried out this program and we're back into producing new knowledge? We health professionals are important because we're involved at every part of this circle of knowledge. We do most of the research, we educate the next generations, we are the translators, we talk to people, we are the practitioners, we are the policy makers, we implement that knowledge and then we close the circle. So I will leave you with the, uh, a phrase that I really like, it's actually the phrase with which we close the report, which comes from a recent book by Louis Menand, this is a Harvard professor who's also a staff writer in the New Yorker, so he writes very beautifully. And um, this is what he wrote. The pursuit, production, dissemination, application, and preservation of knowledge are the central activities of a civilization. Knowledge is social memory, a connection to the past. And it is social hope, an investment in the future. The ability to create knowledge and put it to use is the adaptive characteristic of humans. It is how we reproduce ourselves as social beings and how we change. And this is, I love this phrase, how we keep our feet on the ground and our heads in the clouds. And I think this is what universities are all about. It's about dreaming, keeping our heads in the, in the clouds, but making sure we keep our feet firmly grounded on reality. And that's how we keep making the world a better place. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open to any questions or comments. <laughs> traditional ways you raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, hello, my name, is, my name is David. Thank you for speaking. Um, you showed the, the Rosenau quote, which suggested that public health as a, as a formal discipline from the start uh, recognized that it needed this transdisciplinary approach. Right. Um, but then when you showed the few slides before, the, the slide about incorporation of core competencies uh, across the silos, so medicine, pharmacy, dental, um, as, as that being one of your primary recommendations, how receptive do you feel that the leadership will be in those different silos that don't necessarily have uh, the recognition of need of transdisciplinary approach ingrained in their traditional mindset. How receptive do you feel the leadership of those silos will be to the incorporation of that recommendation? Um, that's a great question. I, I can tell you that the leadership of the associations of schools have been incredibly receptive. The, uh, I think, six or seven main associations, the, Amer uh, you know, the AAMC, uh, American Association of Medical Colleges, the nursing education, the pharmacies, the um, public health, uh, ASPH, etc. I mean, the, the, the six or seven uh, major associations of educators have you know, signed a common manifesto about interprofessional education. Um, it, it gets harder when you get 
to individual institutions. Uh, uh, because, and we were talking about that, uh, you know, you, 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 you get into a lot of customs and sometimes very practical issues like different, different scheduling uh, requirements. Uh, there's a number of barriers. Um, you know, I'm, it's, it's not uh, an easy thing. But I do believe there's such a level of consensus about the need for interprofessional education. Uh, you, you look at it in every single report. Everyone is talking about it. Um, so um, I, I think w what you've done here uh, uh, is, is actually is taking the implementation a step further. And you know, we were talking and we had you know, the committees there it's clear that the leadership of the university is very much behind this idea, and that's what's required. But you know, I, I, I don't think you see that in the majority of universities yet. Um, when it comes to the professional associations, not the associations of educators, uh, also there's a little bit of ambivalence. You know, the world, the, the, the way the health professions look like today, it's not because you know, there's a predetermined natural order that doctors do this, and nurses do this, and dentists do this, and pharmacists do this. This was the result of 150 years of a lot of conflict and turf wars. And you know, the, the boundaries have, have been fought, you know, who can practice what, um, you know, especially, for example, between medicine and nursing. There's been always, a, 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 you know, a lot of, of friction in defining the boundaries. And you see all, uh, countries where, you know, there, there, there's uh, competencies that are carried out by other professionals. So we've developed a whole series of legal mechanisms. I mean, every state has licensure laws that specify that. So breaking across that is going to be much harder. My reason for hope is twofold. One is I, I do think, you know, as, as health care and public health become much more complex, as we move into this, you know, $2.4 trillion, one-sixth of the U.S. economy going into health care. Um, health reform is having been passed. Uh, and whatever happens, it is going to change. I mean, even if, if, it was, uh, if portions of that get repealed, that change is, is going on. It just becomes so, so complex that it requires teamwork. Uh, and then some of the new ideas, like accountable care organizations and others, or payment reform, are creating incentives for efficient ways of working as a team. And if, if we want to remain relevant as educational institutions, we need to be responsive to that change. So that's one reason for hope. And the other is you know, what I saw here today earlier, which shows that some universities are actually doing it. Um, but it, but it, is, it is not just you know, a, a, a matter of declaring and uh, saying we want to do it. It, 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 it requires a lot of work, a lot of imagination, a lot of detailed planning on the way you make, you make it happen. <coughs> Students don't ask questions, we will call on them. <laughs> Just kidding. Psychology, nursing, and medicine has been one of the most rewarding classes we've had so far in our curriculum. And um, I'm very proud that we have that as a um, component of our medical education here. Hello. Hola, Dr. Frank. Soy José Ignacio Mejia Sierra. Jose. Um, you uh, talked about how, like, you know, one sixth of the U.S. economy is devoted to health care. And uh, we hear a lot about, you know, healthcare debate in this country. How do you feel that's, what, what do you think the end to that is going to be and like what the proper role of government is? Okay, can you put the mic a little bit closer? Oh, okay, there we go. Yeah. All right, you talked about how much of the U.S. economy is going towards healthcare. Right. So what do you feel the end of that will be like, how that will finally come about into, uh, into like real reform and mostly like, what do you feel the proper role of government is in that? Because, I mean, you're a big advocate of public health, so. <laughs> Sure. Um, that's another lecture, so you're going to have to invite me again, but, uh, <laughs> uh, which I love to come and come for more time. Uh, well, no, let, but let me tell you, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think there's 
any magic number that a country should spend 10 or 15 or whatever. And I'm not alarmed by the fact that it's 17% of GDP per se. It's what you do with the money. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not as much, I mean, there's m most countries in the world actually underspend in health. Uh, there is such a thing, you know, think about it. I mean, the U.S. is now just above $7,000 per person in health, whereas um, there's African countries that are spending uh, 3 $4 per person. Um, in my own country, which is you know, a large economy, Mexico is the 12th largest economy in the world, it's a middle income country, when I served as Minister of Health, we were spending 5.6% of GDP, clearly insufficient for the health needs of the, of the people. Most countries in the world are underspending. But the question is not so much getting more money for health, but getting more health for the money. In the case of the US, it's not that it's 17%, it's that with 17%, the US still has worse health indicators than, than its peer countries, than, all, all, than every other industrialized countries. It has huge levels of disparities. You witness some of them here in, in, in some of the rural areas in Appalachia and, 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 and other, in other parts, in some of the urban slums. It has you know, low immunization rates among certain population groups. So, <coughs> um, and then the big topic to me in the US has been, I mean, there's been two topics. The fact that there were 40 million uninsured people that you know, will get corrected. And that's the part of the reform that actually cannot be repealed because that process is already in motion. And that's great. I mean, the U.S. was the only industrialized country without universal health insurance. Um, but the second part, which is as important, uh, is to try to reduce the huge variations that you see within the United States in performance of different health systems. The U.S. has within the U.S. some of the most efficient health systems in the world. Uh, really delivering incredible value for, for, for money. And you also have, we also have here, some of the most inefficient health systems. I don't know if you read uh, an, uh, this piece in the New Yorker by Atul Gawande, who's a, a faculty member in my, in my school, comparing two counties in, two neighboring counties in Texas. Pr practically identical from any demographic point of view. And one has the highest billing to Medicare per capita in the entire country and the other has one of the lowest uh, buildings to Medicare. And when you look at it, it's because, you know, the way doctors and nurses practice in one place is very different from another. And some, you know, truly overprescribe and extend stay in hospitals and carry out a lot of tests that really don't add value. Um, you know, this is what we need to correct at, at, in, in, in schools. This is why we need interprofessional education to correct the worst performers. And one of the things we need to do is, you know, are the graduates that go to the high performance ones, you know, one example was the Cleveland Clinic, which has, you know, spectacular levels. Okay, are they different? Are, is there a self-selection here? How do we educate our health professionals to be on the high performance and not the low performance end? And, and that's, that to me is the key question. Those are the two key issues for the US. The first one is in, it's going to be corrected um, with a series of measures that uh, the Affordable Care Act has put in place. And you know, in a few years, the US will join you know, the ranks of most other uh, countries, in, advanced countries in the world. By the way, this is a global problem. It's not the US. As we speak, China is carrying out the largest health reform in the world. They have exactly the same problem as the US. Huge amount of people uninsured because access to insurance was tied to, it's a benefit of employment. So China had the same problem. The only small difference is that the US had 40 million uninsured and China has 600 million. But other than that, you know, it's, it's a very similar problem, even though these are two very different countries. In Mexico, we had exactly the same problem. Insurance was a benefit of employment. And what I had the chance to do when I served as a Secretary of Health was to decouple those two things. So that access to insurance, you have access whether you have a job or not. You decouple those two things. This is the same thing that's happened. So this is a pretty global phenomenon. And the US is now on its way. 
There are some very, very good things of the Affordable Care Act. It, uh, it has, a, you know, the provisions on public health are very important. There's been many countries that extend health insurance, and paradoxically, coverage of immunizations go down because everyone is so focused on, co in, on ensuring people who are sick that we forget the basics of public health. So one important part of the Affordable Care Act is all the provisions around health promotions, health promotion and disease prevention. Those are the parts of the bill that are at risk of being repealed. So I, I hope that doesn't happen. So the second part is much tougher, narrowing these performance gaps. So, I mean, that's you know, an answer, but this is a, a topic for <laughs> a, a, a very big topic. I was wondering, change the subject just a little bit, uh, if there's been any kind of consideration in the upper echelons of academia or Mount Olympus or wherever the policymakers are that decide these things, about the uh, program that's never mentioned too much in America, except uh, in circles such as mine, I'm a criminal defense lawyer, the, the incredible exponential explosion of prisoners, of inmates. And of course, since Ronald Reagan and minimum mandatory sentences, we have near, we're gonna be pushing three million people in prison and I don't know what the percentage is, but so many of them are becoming old, old men who are going to require very expensive health care. No nothing I've heard of anybody planning for this. Is there, this is going to be the most incredible, all of a sudden everybody waking up, what happened? It, it's a serpent, like Benjamin Franklin said about slavery when our country was formed, that's lying there. And has there been anything, any kind of mention as to what to do about this that's, that's already here? You know, from Reagan in the, in the 80s and these minimum mandatory sentencing guidelines, we already are starting to see this. So my question is, this is a public policy, I guess. Is there anything being talked about concerning this? Thank you. I thought when you said that you were a criminal lawyer, we were going to talk about um, um, you know, suing health professionals. <laughs> but um, I'm glad to, hear, to see that that was not where you were. No, because you know, they obviously a big part of the driver of healthcare costs is also the, the way that conflicts between uh, doctors and patients are handled here as opposed to other countries that have developed other mechanisms that are less prone to, to uh, judicial solutions to uh, issues that emerge in the provider-patient relationship. But on the topic you, you touch on, I, I, it's a very important topic. There is such a subfield, if you want, of, of prison health uh, people who actually specialize on the health needs of uh, prison inmates or institutionalized populations in general, but particularly prison inmates. Um, it's, it's obviously, um, you know, it's a very complex topic and you know much more about it than me. But there, first of all, these are typically high-risk populations for a number of health problems, um, uh, like drug abuse and, or substance abuse more, more generally. Uh, many of them are, you know, have violent behaviors. We, of course, spend a lot of time in the court system making that very delicate call as to whether a criminal act was an act of insanity, which then makes it a health issue, or whether it was, you know, a deliberate criminal uh, act, and then it makes it a matter for, for crim the criminal justice system. So there, there's a lot of people who spend their lives thinking about this. But when it comes to the inmate population, however you resolve those other issues, then of course, how do you provide care for, for a population that's captive like that, and as you say, that's aging? Uh, what, what are the procedures that work the best? And you know, that's, that's um, uh, you said changing topics, but let me bring it back to, to, to the, 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 the main topic of, of, of this report. It's a perfect example of how you have a, a, you know, a big part of the health system because the health care that's provided in prisons to prison inmates is a part of the larger health system. There's a very clear requirement there. And unless we create those mechanisms where certain requirements of the health system get reflected in the educational programs, then we're not going to be producing the experts that can address those problems. So it actually illustrates one of the fundamental ideas and one of their recommendations, which is to actually develop mechanisms where you know, a need like that, which you detect because that's your area of expertise, but that probably uh, you know, a lot of deans 
like myself, may be unaware of, how, how do we create the mechanism so that the, <laughs> the competencies we're building and the type of people we're educating can meet some of those requirements? Now, there is that special team. I'm sure that we're not producing enough for the, uh, the, the sort of problem that's looming. And uh, so you illustrate this need for some mechanism for joint planning where, you know, as I said, it's not that universities become subservient to the needs of the health system. We've got to be critical and innovative, but we've got to be talking to those who live the problems of the health system to understand what exactly is it that we need to, to do in, in, in the educational system. I know, there are, I know there are a couple more questions, but I think at this point we should, um, we should end it. And Dr. Frank, I'm sure, will be willing to stay around for a couple of individual questions, if, if you don't mind. Uh, before you go, though, as, as with any good situation, we do have some parting gifts for you. Okay. Um, first of all, we have a, a selection of local memorabilia, including your very own Encyclopedia of Appalachia. Appalachia. The Encyclopedia of Appalachia is a much smaller version right. <laughs> and less reliable. Um, and, and Ian, we also have uh, some, a gift for you as well. You got the Appalachia because yeah. it's much thinner. Yeah. <laughs> and then Julio, thinking of all the awards and accomplishments you had in your life, we thought we'd try to top them with um, the title of honorary professor in the College of Public Health at East oh. Tennessee State University, located in Central Appalachia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just some closing comments. If you want CME credit, please fill out the appropriate paperwork. Uh, the next Leading Voices event will be on March 15th. It'll be a panel of, the, of all living former commissioners of health for the state of Tennessee. It'll be in the Culp Center. And then we'll have another event on April 5th about rethinking food. So thank you all very much. And Julio, thank you again.